I'm Duncan McLeod, and this is Tech Central. We're going to talk telecoms infrastructure today, and I'm pleased to welcome Darren Bedford, Chief Development Officer at WIOC, to the podcast. Darren, welcome. Good to see you. Thank you very much, Duncan. Thank you very much for having us. Now, WIOC is, um, or W-I-O-C-C, is short for West Indian Ocean Cable Company. Um, I've often heard the company's name in reference to the Easy Cable System along the East Coast. That's the East Africa submarine system, um, where I believe the company is an investor. Um, what's the background to WIOC? Was it formed to invest originally in Easy? Sure. So WIOC was set up as a special purpose vehicle just for investing on the Easy Submarine Cable. Uh, the Easy Submarine Cable uh, went live in 2010. Uh, and we were really set up just to uh, operate the investment for the shareholders, our 14 shareholders on the submarine cable. But since then, it's uh, developed into a uh, fully fledged uh, national carrier or international carrier uh, going beyond the easy submarine cable system. So, you know, now we've invested in WAX, mm -hmm. uh, terrestrial networks, etc. So, and it's... Uh, and it's been a real great journey for us. Yeah, so it's been around for how long? Just over a decade? Just over a decade, yeah. So we celebrated our, our 10th, uh, 10th year uh, last year. So it's been a very good, it's been a very good ex experience. Okay, so, so what, what, what was the thinking behind creating an SPV to invest in the easy cable system? And who, who are the shareholders in, in uh, WIOC? So the, uh, the SPV was set up by a gentleman called uh, John Shearer, mm -hmm. who was our founding chairman. Uh, there was a funding gap on, on Easy, uh, and uh, John put a very difficult uh, shareholder together, shareholding together uh, to form this uh, SPV to invest in Easy. Right. So the four, we've got 14 shareholders. Uh, we've got uh, Boffinet in uh, Botswana. We have uh, Tel One in Zimbabwe, and then we have uh, TM Cell in Mozambique, uh, Zantel. Uh, we've got uh, Dalcom in Somalia, uh, Gillette, uh, and a few others. Right. So it's quite a complicated uh, company with shareholding, but it works very well. Okay. Is each shareholder represented on the board? Each shareholder is represented on the board. And I think the unique uh, things the shareholder brings to WIAC is the assets they have in the, each individual countries, which has enabled us to expand WIAC into further into the regions. Yes, yes. Okay. And how, how did your investment into Easy work? Did you simply buy a percentage stake in the cable system? So, yes. Yeah, so basically, it was an investment in the so for a 28% share. Uh, we paid X amount of uh, US dollars and uh, got our 28% share in the submarine cable. Uh, currently, today, WIAC carries more than 50% of the traffic on the submarine cable. Although we only have a 28% 20, uh -huh. share, we carry 50% of the traffic, more than 50% of the traffic is Why? operated by WIAC Why on the system. Uh, I think it's because of the nature of WIAC. You know, we're very progressive. We've got the good shareholders, we've got a good extended network coverage from the Easy Submarine Cable. Uh, and it's just worked very well. So, you know, I think for us expanding into beyond the shores is what's created, uh, you know, the company we are today. Yeah. You know, we could have just, we could just stayed at the landing stations or hardly done any development in country. Yes. But uh, if you don't develop beyond the cable landing station, yeah. uh, you know, you don't really have a sustainable business. Sure, sure. So you, you, you mentioned uh, some of the other systems that um, WIOC has subsequently invested in. Uh, the West Africa cable system, of course, along Africa's west coast, um, I think more commonly known as WAX. Um, Correct. We've also invested in TE North, which is a telecom Egypt uh, cable, I believe, um, or infrastructure running through, through the Egyptian area. Is that right? So that's not correct. So we did, uh, so we we're a shadow investor on WAX. Okay. behind uh, tier one operators. We've got a shadow investment on ERG uh, behind some tier one operators. And then we've got uh, RU uh, investments on CMW3, uh, CMW5, CMW AE1, et cetera. So that's I, how we extend the easy submarine cable into Europe 
from uh, from Djibouti. Okay, you, you you use the term IRU. What does that mean? Indefeasible right of use. So basically, you you pay a whole lot of cash and you get uh, a lifetime access to a specific amount of capacity on the submarine cable. Yeah, yeah. You mentioned the CME Wii cable. I, I think that's the best name submarine cable in the world. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know who came up with that, but it was genius. I mean, we CME, CME 5. Yeah, so there's a lot of acronyms in the market. Yeah, but CME Wii is a very good acronym. I think it stands for South yes. Asia, Middle East, Western Europe. Is that right? That's it. Yeah. That's it. One of the longest cables. One of the longest cables in the world, indeed. indeed. That's it. Okay. Now, now do, you, do you invest primarily in subsea capacity or do you have terrestrial infrastructure as well? So... In the, as I said in the beginning, you know, we're predominantly just investing in the submarine cable. Uh, quickly, we found out that you need to go beyond the uh, cable landing stations. You know, your asset can only go so far. So we started uh, very quickly and early on investing in uh, RU or managed capacity on the terrestrial networks, predominantly in South Africa, where we didn't have a shareholder. Mm-hmm. Uh, and this, is, this has grown over the years. So, you know, it's grown from you know, leasing or buying RUs on STM4s or 16s, you know, now we're at the uh, 100 gig OTU4 level and, you know, buying and owning our own dark fiber. So it is a natural progression uh, for submarine cable owners, especially in Africa. Mm-hmm. Uh, and the growth of traffic over the last two to three years has been exponential. And without investment in dark fiber now, you won't be able to see further growth with managed capacity. Sure. Interesting what you say about uh, um, the growth over the last couple of years. Uh, what have you seen in terms of traffic flowing across uh, your networks um, post the lockdown? So it's very interesting. So we made a calculated decision uh, early on when the COVID-19 uh, pandemic started that we would uh, bulk up our network just in case you know we weren't able to get manufacturing spares or additional equipment to light uh, further capacity so we did bulk orders with our suppliers we got those uh, orders in early in in may before the lockdown and we actually did quite a lot of network deployment since lockdown through to today and we've added probably more than a terabit of backhaul capacity just in south africa alone good grief and the, the growth in capacity Post, uh, uh, post-COVID has been exponential. So, you know, there's been a lot of growth from, you know, the typical OTTs. Yeah. Uh, they've got the uh, video conference platforms and the cloud and the traffic for those has grown. And we've basically just kept adding capacity, you know, month on month for these OTTs. Yeah, yeah, that's incredible. Um, take us through a little bit about what you're doing in South Africa specifically in terms of infrastructure development. So, for the, so since 2010, we've been rolling out, you know, bits and bits and pieces of, of capacity. As I said, you know, we started off, you know, typically with STM 16s and 10 gigs. And it's only after the, in the past three years that this has gone from, you know, as probably having two to 300 gigs on the backhaul in total in South Africa, going to terabits of backhaul. And it's all been driven by the OTTs. And on the back of that... Are we talking the, companies uh, like Netflix, for example, when you say OTT? Netflix, Amazon, yeah. Microsoft, et cetera, et cetera. Right. You know, the, these people are driving internet in Africa. Mm-hmm. And, and it's great because it's driving, the, it's driving the cost down. And what it's doing is we're delivering more capacity, yes. which we like. So its point is having a submarine cable system that's got 12 terabits. And 10 years down the line, you still have eight terabits left. So you want to, you want to get rid of your capacity. You know? And we, we, we like doing large capacity uh, and promoting growth. And we've invested now in NLD one to nine. Uh, we've deployed... Uh, yes, sorry, what is NLD one to nine? So NLD one to nine, it's the routes from uh, Cape Town to Johannesburg, uh, Johannesburg and Tanzini. Uh, it's Johannesburg on the northwest ring through to Botswana borders and back around to Rustenburg. And then NLD five and six is the new coastal route. Uh, and then we've invested from East London to Bloemfontein. So we basically got a figure eight ring around South Africa now as a dark fiber network. Right. Traditionally in the past, we've, we've uh, purchased uh, part 
access to fiber pairs. We bought Spectrum and we've lit Spectrum on other people's networks. And with the growth that we've had over the last two years, we decided that we had the natural progression was for us to own our own dark fiber and to light our own fiber so that we could deliver services much quicker. And I think one thing that's unique about WIAC is the speed that we deliver our services, whether it's a one gig, 10 gig or 100 gig. We get them delivered within weeks, not months. Mm -hmm. So I think that's the difference. Right. We've so, seen, sorry, carry on. So carry on. I was just going to ask, we've seen one of your competitors in the subsea business um, expanding into the services business as well, launching an ISP, uh, even in the consumer space most recently. Um, is, that, is that something you'll consider as WIAC or will you stay very much in the uh, wholesale business? Why could always be a wholesale player. Okay. So even though we invest in long haul networks and we invest in metros, what we're doing is we're creating an ecosystem for smaller ISPs that don't have the resources or the funding to go and build those networks. So we, so it's basically another extension for our submarine investments. So right. now we can get right close to the customer, but the ISP or the enterprise uh, player will always own the customer. Sure. And the data center business, is that something that interests you potentially? Uh, potentially, potentially it's something we, we may look at. Uh, we've obviously uh, operate cable landing stations around, around Africa for easy. Yes. So it's, it's a similar sort of a business, but it's something we may look at too in the future. Okay. All right. All right. Great. I wanted to explore um, the new cables that are coming to Africa. Um, we've seen the news that... Um, Equiano and to Africa, um, the former being built by Google and the latter having uh, backing of a range of companies, including Facebook. Um, what, what impact do you see these cables having on the African continent? Do you think we're going to have a glut of bandwidth? Is it justified to be building two, two uh, cable systems like this with the sort of capacity that both Google and Facebook are talking about? I think this, the new cable investments are very much needed. So if we look at Wax, Easy, Seacom, and the cables on the, the west coast uh, of Africa in Nigeria, etc. You know, these cable systems are almost 10 years old. Uh, the old consortium type cables. Uh, they're reaching end of capacity uh, upgrade life. So yeah. we are getting to a point where, you know, when OTTs are wanting to activate one, two or three terabits of traffic over a time period, we know these older cable systems can't support that now. Mm -hmm. So, you know, what's the future going to hold? Yes, there will still be easy and wax for the foreseeable future, uh, but we do need new cable systems to come in to bring this additional bulk capacity to Africa. Yeah. And there's going to be a massive growth in Africa over the next two to five years. You know, if we look not just at South Africa, if we look at the trends in South Africa, that's going to replicate in Nigeria and Ghana and things like that mm -hmm. as soon as the terrestrial networks are more developed. Yes, yes. So insatiable, insatiable demand coming. Definitely. Is, is WIOC interested in participating in either of these two new cable systems? So into Africa, we will be involved in all the, on all the new submarine cable systems and we will have access to these systems and capacity, etc. And this is one of the reasons why we're investing so heavily on our submarine networks. Mm -hmm. Be uh, sorry, on our terrestrial networks, because we do need to ensure that we're ready and ready in time well before these investments come to uh, fruition that we can deliver large scale capacity from these cable systems because they are going to be 100, ter you know, the 100 terabit systems. They're massive systems. Unbelievable. You know, they're multiple, multiple fiber pairs now. You know, Easy and Wax are two fiber pair systems. You know, so with a whole lot of shells sharing one pair. Now you're going to have 12 pair systems. So the amount of capacity is astronomical. Prices have but come we, all, we, 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 all, we always say there's, you know, there's never, there's always too much capacity, but yeah. it always seems to be more growth. Yeah, yeah, it just keeps coming. Um, uh, we've come, obviously come a long way since the bad old days when telecom was the only game in town in terms of international capacity. And when prices were exceptionally high, um, uh, I forget who was telling me this, this the other day, but they said that the price of international bandwidth into South Africa has fallen by more than 99% uh, since Telcom's monopoly was broken. Um, with these additional cables coming, is there scope, do you think, for further price reductions on the international bandwidth? 
we always say that the price can never really get any lower, but it always does. So <laughs> there, there is there, there is a point where there is a cost to capacity. Of course. You know, there is an operational cost. So there always will be a point where you can't go any lower. But we're seeing now, I mean, if you look in 2010, an STM1 was selling for 160,000 US dollars a month. And how fast is an so, STM1? 155 megabits. Okay. So, so you can see the demand and then as demand increases, the price declines and it does get to a point where, you know, capacity and price decline yeah. sort of narrow it together, but it is, it will still get lower. Yeah. How much lower? I can't tell you that. It's the, the market, the market makes its own decisions. Yeah. We, we like to sell capacity of fair market value. You know, obviously we've got investments uh, to repay, so you you know you can't drop it to to zero, yeah. but uh, yeah, I think uh, I think it still has some way to drop. Fascinating. Well, Darren Bedford is the chief development officer at WIOC. Thank you so much for sharing your insights with Tech Central. It was very good to talk to you today. Thank you very much.